come before you and I thank you. I thank you, Lord God, this evening for the opportunity to share your precious word with my brothers and sisters. To share the beauty of your word and the power of your word. To find that place in our hearts. To enable us, to instruct us, to heal us, to make us whole. And to lead us in that place of growth. To lead us in that place, Father God, of overcoming. Not just in breakthroughs that come back around and we've got to break through again. But into overcoming. Lord, I pray that each and every person here tonight put in their hearts, open up their hearts to hear the word specifically for you, the reign of God's word. Let it fall not on dull ears, but on hearts that are pricked to hear the truth for themselves. Lord, let us not think about what others need to hear tonight. Let us concentrate on what we need to hear in us. Amen. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Before I go too far, uh, you all have naturally seen the news where we've had some local young people being killed. Uh, no rhyme, no reason for any of that, whether it be uh, accidents. A young boy, 17 years old, got thrown from a horse and, and was thrown into a pond and, and drowned and got some young girl, 16 year old girl was shot I don't know how many times in the back when sitting in the car. I mean on and on and on and on. And the reason why I bring this up at the beginning of the message is because sometimes we are so caught up in things that we are just entangled in that we, we don't even have compassion for people that are having experienced so much calamity. Uh, like this, this family that I'm sure that lost their 17 year old son. We need to pray for that family. You say, well, I don't know them. It really doesn't matter if you know them or not. What matters is you can relate to their loss. But you can't do that if your attitude is all about you. And that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. We talked about the, uh, not as uh, the world gives, we talked about the peace of the Lord. Well, that comes from God, but it has to find the right attitude in us to nest in, to grow in. Amen? And that's what I want to talk about tonight. That's why the, the name of the message here is Beware the Slippery, slippery Ground You're On. Now, forgive me, I'm, uh, I have an assignment of congestion trying to come to my sinal passages that can't prosper. I'm going to preach through it anyway. Amen. Do I have an amen to that? So amen. open your ears. And while it, when it tries to stop me from preaching, you just keep on praying. Amen. amen. All right. Praise the Lord. There is a slippery ground that most of us are on at times that we don't even recognize. And the way this message came up, uh, the name, uh, the way the name of this message came about was how many of you have got a lot of rain around your house lately? Oh, yeah. And you know it settles on the ground quite a bit. If you got cement like I have around some patio blocks, after a while, after a while the sediment settles underneath the water, and it, when the water resides, it leaves a kind of a, a, a coating, or if you will, a film on it, and you don't notice it because you when you get off of that, like me, a lot of times they come off the porch, and I'm not looking where I'm walking, I'm looking at whether or not it's still raining. And I stepped off the step yesterday morning, wow. and man, I hit that thing, and if it wouldn't have been by the grace of God, I'd have been flat on my back. And God spoke to me and said, that's what my people do too many times. Yeah. They're on slippery ground, and they don't even know it. It depends what you step on. It depends where you step at. And you and I, whether it be a lot of rain happening in your house, I'm talking about a spiritual application here. I'm talking about an area in your life that you let a lot of sediment that is not of God, a lot of, a lot of uh, debris, if you will, settle on your pathway. And you're too busy looking around at everybody else and other things to realize that you are on slippery ground. And if you're not careful, you're going to end up on your back. And nobody wants to end up on their back. Amen? At least I don't. The reading I want to start off with is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. 
And you'll also, we'll also find our text reading in there. Again, remember, it is beware of the slippery ground you are on. Now, I'm saying that because I know for a fact that most of us, at one time or another, are caught up in attitudes that will land you on your back. And I don't mean in a, a right way. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. When you get there, say amen. Amen. Let me get there. The Bible says, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of your mind. Is that what your word has? Now, brother, let me ask you something. What does vanity of your mind mean? Huh? Void of principles, void of, uh, it's more self-interest, if you will. Uh, it explains it to me in, in this way in the next verse. Having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts or their heart. Who being fat, who being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all in cleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. Are you with me? Amen. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, what are you and I supposed to do? next two verses is your text. How many of you have been taught by the Lord Jesus Christ in here? Amen. How many of you have been taught by the Holy Spirit in here? Amen. How many of you are continuously being taught? Amen. Well, let me ask you something. Does the next two verses belong to you or somebody else? Is it a personal admonition to you and I? Amen. Yeah. What does it tell us to do? Is there options here? And whose responsibility is this? It's ours, isn't it? Our text reads this way, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. So we know that it's not just talking about your lip service. It's talking about your conduct. Who again, tell me again, who's to put this off? So that means if we have a lousy attitude, who's to deal with that? Well, you mean it's not the devil's fault? No. Who's to deal with that? No. Why don't we? <laughs> why don't we? We'd rather complain and murmur about why we feel the way we feel. We'd rather murmur and complain because, you know, things are not adding up or I'm miserable or I, I feel terrible or I'm discouraged or I'm depressed or proud. All these things are real, but I want to ask you something. What have you done on your part? What have I done on my part? What have I done in putting off the former conduct in my life? What have you done in putting off? Well, Pastor, I did it way back yonder. I'm not talking about way back yonder. I'm talking about today. How many of you know that attitudes are a daily thing? Oh, yeah. The text is this. The principal verse, verses is this. Then you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So we know, first of all, that we need to continuously do something. Put off the old man. That is our responsibility. Do you think that affects our attitudes? Do you think if you're walking in the vanity of your mind, you're going to probably have a, a lousy attitude and that you're probably going to find yourself alienated from the life of God? Do you not realize that being alienated from the life of God is not something Satan has done to you? Do you not realize that as a believer, when you're alienated from the life of God, it means the peace of God, it means the love of God, it means the joy of God. It's not because of Satan, it's because of vanity of your own mind. The attitude of your mind. 
the attitude of your thoughts, the attitude of your heart. Your thoughts are based not on someone else's actions, it's based on the thoughts of your heart. It says this, and that you put on the new man. Well, first of all, we need to put off one, we need to renew the spirit of our mind, number two, and number three, we need to put on the new man, which is not after our fashion or our design, but after God's design, right? And it says, wherefore, and then it goes on to explain that to us, just give us examples. It says, wherefore, putting away the lying. He's given us an example of putting off the old man, our actions. You know, he didn't just leave us there with, with, our, with our imaginations. He point blanks, tells, gives us an example. Well, for instance, your old man lied. Well, not me, Pastor. Yeah, you. I never, oh yeah, you did. And it's not speaking just for the fact that you're lying. It's speaking, using that as, as a way of you understanding that when you say that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, all things pass away and all things become new, and you stay stuck in your old attitudes, who's lying, God or you? We are. Why? Because you never put off the old man. Well, pastor, it's too hard. You don't understand. Brothers and sisters, it's not about the understanding. And it's not about whether or not it's too hard or not hard enough. God never promised you and I a rose garden, and neither did he tell you you and I would not struggle. In fact, he said we would struggle, but we would overcome. Because we can do all things through Christ Jesus' strength and us, right? I want to tell you something. The words that we speak are not enough unless we're willing to own them for ourselves. The Word of God says here, Wherefore, putting away lies, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. You, your attitude affects me. <clears throat> My attitude affects you. You know why? Because we're one of another. We are part, not the whole, we are part of the body. When you lie, when you do things, when, you, when you're angry, when you're upset, or whenever you act out, whatever emotions you have, it affects me because I'm part of you and you're part of me. It affects everybody. One way or another, it will come back to haunt you. One way or another. It says here, verse 26, Be ye angry. And sin not. In other words, don't let your attitude or your emotions rule you. Don't go for this tit for tat thing, you know. Well, he did that, she did that, they did the, that, so therefore I have a right. You don't have a right to do anything that's remotely like what they did. You say, well, I do have a right. Okay, uh, God said you have that right, but you're going to bear the consequences for your right. You still want that right? But oh, Pastor, I want to repent after I say my mind. Well, yeah. yeah, that's what we like to do. We like to speak our minds and do our thing and then ask God to forgive us on the way out. That's exactly right. And plus, God knows the, the deeper things of the heart, doesn't he? Our mouths say a lot of things to appease God, but God knows the heart. The Bible says here, be angry, be angry, and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So we know that this, in itself, when we operate in the old man, in the old conduct, in the old conversation, in the old thinking, the old way of doing things, the old vengeance, the old malice, the old tit for tat things that we do, what do we do? That's right, we give place to the devil. The devil doesn't need the key to get in. He just needs for you to open the door. The Bible says here, you can get place to the devil. Then he goes on again. And he says, hey, listen, how, well, you know, how do you do that? He's not talking so much about lying or stealing. He's talking about doing your own thing. Doing and thinking your own way. Oh, but I love the Lord. Well, then he says, prove it. Oh, but I love God. He says, if you love me, then you love the brethren. Oh, but you don't know, God, what they did to me. Well, let me ask you something. Did people do more to you than they did to Christ when they hung him on the cross? When they spat at him, pulled his beard, uh, striped his back? When they, they jeered at him and made fun of him? When they looked upon his nakedness? Do you think that you have had more things happen to you than God's paid the price for? Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. 
So he goes on and gives you a paradox here. He says, listen, stop stealing. In other words, he's not talking about stealing. He's talking about this. And what you did before, do just the opposite. That's what he's talking about. If you were depressed and if you were angry all the time and you said things and did things that were contrary to the word of God, which is called the vanity of your mind, he is actually saying, do just the opposite. The other day, how many of you get tired of seeing the rain? How many of you complain a little bit about the rain? I told my lovely wife the other day, we were talking and she said, oh, I just can't, I just don't know what to do about this rain. Do it about the... And I said, let's start thanking God for the rain. What do you mean thanking God for the rain? Well, if you remove the frustration from it, Satan can't do anything with it. Change your perspective, you change your outcome. Don't wait for the outcome to change before your perspective changes. Change your perspective and expect the outcome to change. Let us seek a wall. It says, let him labor work with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give that needed. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Edifying means to what? Build up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, Whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And then it, once more it comes right back and tells you what to be aware of if you don't. If you don't deal with that old man. If you say, well, Pastor, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Keep trying. Keep getting up. Keep doing what it's telling you for you to do. Stop. When you stop doing it and give up, then you know what happens? The fruit of giving up starts to pile up. Like what? Bitterness. It is said that depression is anger turned inwards. Well, you know, that sounds very psychological and all the brainiacs go for that. But you know, you have something that you can do about that. You can lay it down before the Lord and say, I don't want this. It mean it. I, I won't have this. And you know what the Lord's going to say? But it's start prophesying you won't have it. Start saying, I'm not going to be depressed. I'm going to be excited. I'm not going to let, let this attitude in me destroy all the wonderful attributes and the wonderful things God wants to work in me. You start speaking what you want to see because God has declared it. Listen, you, you want to stay in your old man? Is that what you want? You want to truck this, just keep going, oh Lord, come quickly. Even so, Lord, come quickly. Well, what about what you're supposed to be doing in the midst of that? What about the person that is waiting to see you get off of your dead horse and say, listen, I have enough of this. I'm going to enjoy, I'm going to enjoy and declare the word of God. I'm going to live in the joy of the Lord. I'm going to declare that God's word will not fall on deaf ears, especially mine. Let all bitterness he brings it to you. A summation here, brother. Watch here. He says, okay, you've heard everything I have to say. So if you agree, do you agree that you have the responsibility to do something about your attitude? And if you don't, do you agree that you're walking on slippery ground? Because sooner or later, you're going to fall. And guess what? If there's somebody on the side of you that is trying to help you and you're not trying to help yourself, you're going to fall. You're going to cause him to fall with you. That's why you need somebody strong on the side of you to remind you, look down. Every step that you take is your responsibility. Clear the path. How do I do it? Well, he says this. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You put it away. You get rid of it. And then he says this. Don't just get rid of it without putting something else there. And be kind one to another. Be tenderhearted 
forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, had forgiven you. Beware the slippery ground you're on. Church tonight, as you can see, I am talking about attitudes. I am talking about our rights and our right to have them. Yes, you have a right to own the attitudes you have right now. You do. Because God is not taking that choice from you. But having the right to own the attitudes that you have right now, you're also going to bear the consequences that go with that right. Because that's your choice. But they do come with consequences. All rewards. And they always come with choice. Our text, as I said earlier, is housed in this reading text of Ephesians 4, 17 through 32. The principal verses are actually Ephesians 4, verses 22 and 24. That you put off concerning the former conversation, conduct, slash conduct, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Your theme is this. Your attitude about anything in your life, your attitude, hear me well now, and I'm going to stress it. Your attitude about anything in your life is your choice. Not anybody else's. Your choice. So if you choose to be bitter, if you choose to be unforgiving, if you choose to be loose-tongued and angry and filled with malice, that's your choice. But you're going to bear the consequences of that. I've said many times, and I'll say it again by way of introduction tonight, because it never gets old to those of us who are not dull of hearing, to those of us who want a different outcome in life concerning issues that we seem to constantly deal with. Everything we think and do in life is of our choice. Everything. Yes, no matter what the circumstance is, my brothers and sisters, it's of our choice. Choice and circumstance don't dictate choice. It doesn't dictate choice. I mean, it shouldn't define your choice. Circumstances and situations should never, ever define nor dictate to you how you want to live out something. If it does, then you need to examine your heart and see if you're in the faith. Because God has given us the power to overcome the circumstance and the situation internally so we can face it externally. Everything we think and do in life is about choice. And as I said, no matter what the circumstance, it's your choice on how you deal with things. And yes, how you deal with people. You know, I've always said that either you will view them just to throw those situations, or even people, and we talked about it Sunday, Brother Clive, as either stepping stones or stumbling blocks. That is something you determine. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your attitude? Because if the attitude is not right before God, then every choice you make will bear consequences of that choice, and they will be stumbling blocks instead of stepping stones. Because attitude has everything to do, the right attitude has everything to do with turning the, the stumbling blocks into stepping stones. If your attitude is not right, those stepping stones or those stumbling blocks remain stumbling blocks. And you'll never go anywhere. You'll never do anything different. I've always said that, that how you view uh, the things that you face every day enables you to have a positive attitude or a negative attitude. And I'm not talking about just positive thinking. I'm talking about something greater than that. I'm talking about our attitudes. I'm talking about what empowers us to grow. You know, one, if your attitude is right concerning what you're going through right now, it will empower you, as I said Sunday, with spiritual endorphins, endorphins that cause you to grow through this, and your faith is strengthened. 
But on the same token, if your attitude is not right, what you're dealing with, you become toxic, toxic to yourself. And you release endorphins within yourself and everybody around you, then it becomes toxicity. It takes away from the, the healthiness of God's word to your life. You understand? It's you that determines that. Is your attitude toxic to yourself or to your walk? Is your attitude, because if your attitude is toxic to you, it's because of your choices, how you handle, what your attitude is like. If you're constantly blaming other people or situations or circumstances for the way that you choose, then you got it backwards. Your choices have empowered your circumstances or they've enabled your circumstances to be stepping stones or stumbling blocks. But what are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, you know, that's the way I am. You know, that's the way it is. You don't know. I'm, uh, this is my cross. I've got to bear it and, until the Lord comes and takes me. You don't have to bear what God didn't give you to bear. You know, a lot of times we, when Del and I go out to eat, we do on purpose um, to tip somebody genuinely. I mean, with a generous tip. Not because we want to show ourselves to be rich, because we're not. But we want people to know that we appreciate their service. There's nothing to me more angry or aggravating is for a believer to walk around thinking that they're good stewards of God's money when they haven't blessed somebody when they can. Especially when somebody serves you. Especially, I always look to, for someone that's new and fresh and that's uh, scared. You know, don't know if they're doing anything right. And I want them to know that just the attitude of them wanting to do right, God wants to bless them. And like I said, it, to me, I've heard it as such a, a obnoxious people, Brother Brian, sometimes they brag about, well, you know, uh, I didn't. I left $2 tip for somebody. Like if they, you know, I got to be a good steward of God's money. Yet, you know what it means to really serve people and get paid a decent wage for it? I do. I was a waiter at one time. And believe me, it's not an easy job. Yes, it's attitude. And I, it never, you know, when people tell me, you know, I'm, I'm a, a good steward of God's money because I'm, I'm a Christian, and they go out and they want to Jew down everybody for a, a, a right, for something they want to buy. Instead of asking God, Lord God, bless them and bless me in this transaction. Oh, you want to, ah, Jude them down. Well, that's a really a shame. To even take that attitude. Because you see, if that's the attitude you take, then what are you doing with the money you save? Are you turning around sowing it in good ground? Or are you building a bigger barn? I'm just using this as examples. This is not what the message is about. Attitude covers a whole lot of things, don't you think? Yes. And I, let's say, in me, it covers probably about five foot, eight inches high, and about a hundred and somewhat pounds. I ain't gonna tell you what that is. <laughs> That's how much attitude I have to deal with. Because everything that involves my attitude involves me as a person, as I told my, my wife uh, yesterday, uh, our neighbors lost their one of their, their little dog. Uh, and it was terrible. You know, it's you know, anybody that loves animals as we do, when, when you lose a, a, an animal, it's it's like your family member. The point I'm trying to make is that you see, everything has its own space in this world. Every animal has its own space. I believe that. God created that animal to have a certain space, a certain time. And when that space is emptied, you don't just put something else there for the sake of, of not remembering. You, you, that space is still empty, and it will always be empty except for memories. But it also affects attitudes. When you, when you have a, a, a lousy attitude, and you fill it with lousy ways of dealing with that attitude, you make no room for anything else to come there. If all you want to do is get back at somebody for what they did or didn't do, if all you want to do is operate in malice or unforgiveness, if all you want to do is, how, is, how are you going to change your attitude? How are you going to occupy your space that belongs to you? 
Are you going to be a ripple effect of good with somebody that you're just running into? Or are they going to know you as a cheap person that claims to be a Christian, that, that squeaks with their walk, that has no joy in their life, that every time you, you look at them, they're always frowning or always bent over with, with being a victim instead of being a victor? Oh no, my brothers and sisters, you, you, can't, you can't bring a gospel worth having if all you do is walking around because with that kind of attitude because you know what that is? You know what that leads to? That leads to murmuring and complaining because you can't have that kind of attitude and be grateful to God. You can't have that kind of attitude and just rejoice in the liberty that God has given you and I. You wear the slip of ground you're on. Uh, Pastor, you know, I, I, I don't quite agree with you. I really don't care. <laughs> because you see, it's not me you need to agree with. The word of God is explicit. It says this, that, you know, you are to put off the old man. And if your old man, if the new man that you say that you have resembles more of the old man than the new man, then somebody's wrong here. And somebody needs an, an adjustment called an attitude adjustment. If your old man is more what you're walking in than the new man, somebody is messed up and is not God. How many of you want to stay like you are? How many of your attitudes that you have are whoop, right on target? How many of you are tired of walking around in the same old Mari pit? That you've been walking around with in here for years. Amen. Well, then you know something? You gotta do something about it. You gotta change your attitude in more than one place. I found in my life attitudes are like are like chain links. One link to another until it becomes a chain. And if that chain is not broken, it ties you up pretty well. Amen. Are y'all hearing me today? As a believer, brothers and sisters, the outcome is about choice. And as I spoke about Sunday, spiritual endorphins can either be good or bad. They can feed toxic attitudes that birth forth certain out outward effects in our lives, as our text really talks about. Or it can bring about good growth, good, solid steps of success in your walk with the Lord. Let me let me show you what or read to you what uh, Miriam Webster's dictionary says about attitude. It says it's an internal position. According to the Miriam Webster dictionary, the word attitude means an internal position of feeling with regard to something else or someone else. Other words often used as synonyms are disposition, feeling, mood, opinion, sentiment, temper, tone, perspective, frame of mind, outlook, view, or moral, or morale, put it that way. Brothers and sisters, our attitudes are an outward display of what's taking place in our hearts. Don't you understand that? Sooner or later, what's really happening in your heart is going to be expressed. It's in your face, your action, the way you treat other people, the way you talk to other people. When our hearts focus on the right place, our attitudes will too. That's all there is to it. The only thing that you and I have to lose by choosing a positive, right attitude, and you say, well, what's the right attitude? Come on, you know what the right attitude is about certain things in your life, do, don't you? I mean, come on. The Word of God is full about what it tells you what's the right attitude. So you know what the right attitude is. You know, you know, not only do you know what the right attitude is by the Word of God, but you know when you do something with the wrong attitude, how it makes you feel. The right attitude builds you up and, and gives you this sense of peace. It's what God has given you. I mean, he's left you with his feet because you're in the right attitude. But the wrong attitude leaves you with this down feeling, this oppressive feeling. And, and nothing turns out right. 
Everything you touch starts to become toxic because your attitude is wrong. I believe that the only thing we have to lose by choosing a positive attitude, my brothers and sisters, is a negative one. When you choose a positive attitude, the right attitude, the only thing you stand to lose is a negative attitude. Colossians 3.17 and also verses 23 through 25 speaks personal, and again, that's Colossians 3.17 and also verses 23 through 25 speaks personally to each of us. To each of us. And to our responsibility to deal with our attitudes and how. It also gives us the warning of what happens when we don't. Again, that's Colossians 3.17 and also verses 23 through 25. The Bible says in Colossians 3.17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, are you with me? Amen. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. That's what our attitude should be and must be. And in verses 23, 25 through 25, it says that whatsoever you do, do it heartily with the right attitude. Do it with all of your heart. No holdbacks. As to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he has done. And there is no respect of persons. Do you hear that? There's no respect of persons. You will receive. Concerning the attitude and the way that you serve God. And that means, brothers and sisters, you need to hear something. When you say you serve God, you love God, that includes the body of Christ. That includes how you represent and present yourself amongst the world. Now listen, we all, we say this song, I love the Lord. We all have a tale, we all have a story. That's without a doubt. But you know, how many of you have ever had a dog that all they do is chase their tail? <laughs> God wants you to stop chasing your tail. That tale and, your, and that story is behind you. It's not something you chase. It's something that follows you for a testimony. See, too many people, and you know why they chase the tail a lot of times? A lot of times they got a, an itch they can't scratch. A lot of times it's a flea. Just enough to cause you to go around in circles. Time to stop that. I believe it's time for you and I to really walk in the right attitude because you choose to. You see, you have to choose to. I mean, you can go around a point of favor or being angry at somebody in the body of Christ or even in the world that has done wrong and you walk around with this attitude like, you know, everybody's against you. You're all by yourself. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares what you're going through. Well, let me tell you something. You're not alone. And most of what you're going through compared to somebody else's woes can be very light. I'm not minimizing what you're going through, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of other people, whether it might be even in your own church family, but there's a lot of other people that are going through a lot of things. And their attitude doesn't stink. Their attitude, they may be having financial struggles, but they're not going to make sure that they, they walk around letting people know that they're they're broke and they're, they can't do nothing and but they're, they can't do this can't do, God will take care of them when we when we bless people uh, by tipping them you ought to see their eyes and usually young people they're so happy and I'm not talking about a hundred dollars I mean you're talking about ten dollars if the meal is sufficient you know you say oh that, that's way too much until you don't know the end of the stick I was raising two children, waiting on tables, and going to school at the same time. I'm not lifting myself up. I'm just trying to make it a, help you understand something. 
You are responsible for putting off the old man. I'm talking about your attitudes. If your attitudes stunk when you walked in the world with them and you still carry them today, they stink double them up. Because you are the image of someone else. You are walking with a new man. In a new man, you're supposed to be what God has called you to be a new man. And it doesn't happen overnight, but you need to be aware it's got to happen by your choices. Lord, free us tonight from the shackles of a bad attitude. Work in our hearts, Lord, and in our minds to help us transform our thinking from negative to positive. Lord, despite the struggles that we face, Lord, fill us with joy that can only come from you in Jesus' name. And let us, Father, have a ripple effect of well-being to others and other people's lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. Church, as I said earlier, every situation and circumstance that, it, that you encounter feeds an attitude. It does. And it is dependent upon what attitude you really are nourishing in your heart towards something or someone. I know a lot of times it's very hard I know enduring problems with a smile and pure joy in your heart is difficult. I understand that. God understands that. But he's made a way. He says, I made a way for every temptation for you to give up, every temptation for you to choose the wrong way. He says, I made a way of escape. He said, if you, if you look to me and depend on me and, and choose to have the right attitude, instead of always blaming or always being under, under an oppressive spirit, choose to break that spirit. If you're sad, start being glad. If, you're, if you feel alone, start showing yourself friendly so that you can have more brothers and sisters who want to be around you. Well, what do you mean? What, what, what do you mean? No, you've got to be outside yourself. If you want to show, as they say, if you want to show, if you want friends, then show yourself friendly. If you want to, to be with other people and have other people be with you and then, ah, I don't want to be with anybody else, but then you're in the wrong body. Because you see, Christ expects us to be a part, uh, yoked to one another. He expects you to want to be with one another. You don't have to be in each other's trunk. But you need to be encouraging to one another. You need to have the right attitude. You need to know that the Lord God will hold you accountable on that day of theme of judgment. When you stand before the Lord. He's going to judge you and I, brothers and sisters. And I think the greatest thing he's going to judge you and I for is what did you do with this new man that he gave you? What did he do? What did you do with this new heart that he gave you? What did he do with this new attitude that's supposed to be developed in you? What excuse are we going to bring before him? Like I said, I know enduring problems with a smile is difficult. And I don't recall the Lord saying that it wouldn't be difficult. And I know that many challenges that we face do not warrant a smile. But I do know this. When our attitude's right, whether you're smiling or not, you will become stronger believers and open the door for an attitude transformation and God will fill you up with his presence. I know that. Because you know, sooner or later, you got to understand, if you want fr uh, fresh produce in your life, you got to get rid of the old produce. How many of you like fresh vegetables in here? I do. I've learned I can't keep fresh vegetables too long because they spoil. What makes it? you think that you can keep old attitudes too long before they spoil? You got to get rid of them. You want new produce in your life? You got to get rid of the old produce. You got to throw them out. I don't know, and I tell you what, sometimes it seems costly. But in the long run, let me ask you something. How many of you have ever picked fruit in here off of a tree? How many of you can tell me where the fruit's found at? Is it at the beginning of the branch or the end? Yeah. It's at the end of the branch, right? You know why? Because fruit takes a process to grow it. It's never found at the beginning. It's found at the very end. It means that there's a time, there's a process to grow in fruit. There's a, there's a Fresh produce must be grown. How many of you ever opened an ice box and smelled an uncommon smell in there? 
It's usually when you try to keep something that don't belong in there longer than it should. Anybody hear me today? Yeah. See, that's what happens with attitudes. After a while, you can say, well, that's my choice. It's my life. It's what I'm going to do. Well, let me tell you something. Attitudes kept too long starts to stink no matter who wears them. I've heard it said, and I know it for a fact, that to have fresh produce, you need to make way by getting rid of old produce. Whatever your attitudes produced before that are not good, why should you want to hang on to them? There's nothing worse than having outdated produce in your life. It becomes bitter and spoiled. Might even produce E. coli, which is toxic. That's what happens to the wrong attitude in your heart. It becomes toxic. It's time you and I and we all need to do self-examination here, change the thoughts that produce the same old, same old, or something new and bright and filled with God's life. You say, well, how, Pastor? Well, start by speaking with great expectations. If you feel way done, say, Lord God, I thank you that you set me free. And then go about making sure that you are set free. How do you do that? By changing the way that you think on things. I've said it over and over again. If you stay in that fiery pit, guess what? You're going to stay in that pit. And instead of it being shallow, it's going to get deeper. Why don't we start making statements like, Lord, I can't wait to see what's going to happen tomorrow because I have a changed attitude today. Lord, I can't help but thank you, Lord God, that I'm not the same person I used to be. And Lord God, I'm putting off that old man. No matter how many times it was to jump on my back, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to get rid of that old produce, uh, that old produce in my life. I'm not going to let negative thoughts have their way with me. I'm not going to let that thing that caused me to act the way I did before to act again. I'm going to toss that old man down and I'm going to keep him down. But you got to want to do it. Oh, no, I'm just going to be miserable the rest of my life until God takes me home. What a self-centered life. Do you realize that when we have lousy attitudes, it's because our lives are self-centered? You don't care about anybody else. You care only about your problems, your self-centeredness. Doesn't sound like it's God to me. How many of you can, can say amen to that? Amen. You know, I've seen times times and times again when people will say they won't change. They cry out to God, Lord God, I just I, I, I'm so tired of being miserable and I keep hearing God say, well then stop being miserable. He said, well pastor, that's easier said than done. I've been on the other side of being miserable and it's much better not to be miserable. It's much better to have great expectations. But it's much better to realize that you have just as much a part to do with your attitude as God does. He's not going to drag you. He's not going to make you. But brothers and sisters, let me warn you. You need to be aware of the slippery ground of your own. If your attitude is bad, and your attitude, let's put it this way. If your attitude is not right before God, then it's not right before man either. You ever wonder why everybody that you work with seems to have a problem? They got problems, but you don't. But it seems like everybody that comes your way seems to pick on you. After a while, you got to wonder, well, maybe it's not just them. Maybe I've got a problem, too. Maybe it's everybody that, that uh, seems to want to disagree with me or make my life miserable. Maybe it's not just them. Maybe it's a little bit of me or maybe it's a whole lot of me. You know, I read an interesting article, Brother Brian, and you ladies, I'm not just singling out my brother or Brother Washer or Brother Jonathan. Or Brother Clyde, no, I read an article I found was quite interesting concerning airplane pilots. And I likened it unto us as believers, especially concerning our attitudes on how we approach everyday life situations and people in our lives. Let me read to you what the article said. The article said airplane pilots often use the word attitude 
to describe their horizontal relationship with the runaway. Runway, the, how they're going to approach the landing. They use the word attitude. Isn't that interesting? How they're going to approach, and like they said, the horizontal relationship with the runway before they attempt to land. That's the key word. What is my attitude concerning this landing? Then they land or they don't land, depending on the attitude. In other words, the relationship of the airplane to the landing strip. Listen. If their attitude isn't aligned properly, the plane will make contact with the ground at the wrong angle. And it will cause them to crash or do other damage because they are not in sync with where they're trying to land. In essence, their attitude, or in essence, your attitude, my attitude, is an inward disposition or relationship toward other things such as people or circumstances that are not right or are right. As in, with an airplane, attitude is applied whenever you must deal with something other than yourself. And getting the right relationship but in turn, it affects the outcome of who you are and become on a daily basis. I found that very interesting. Brothers and sisters, I believe it's time we start taking responsibility for what's going on in our lives, in our hearts, because out of it come the issues of life. All of life that you and I are involved in. Our attitudes affect affect or infect them. According to the Word of God, in Proverbs, we know it well, Proverbs 4, verses 20 through 27, the Bible says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them. And it says that they are health unto all their flesh. The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence. In other words, keep your attitude right. Keep your attitude right. For out of it are the issues of life. Put away from the forward mouth. Forward is an opinionated mouth or an oppositional mouth or an argument stance in words or actions. It says to put away perverse lips, put far from thee. Let your eyes look right on and let your eyelids look straight before thee. It says to ponder the path of your feet and let your ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left and says to remove thy foot from evil. Brothers and sisters, according to God's word, when you become a genuine believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, as to Willardeen, it says a part of your new creation is the development of a new attitude. How can you be a new creation uh, if your attitude is still of the old nature? Because you chose to leave it that way. How can you uh, resonate with the airplane pilot trying to uh, develop the right attitude to have a proper landing. Well, I look at that the same way that you and I in our relationship to other people or situations and circumstances that we approach. Is your landing right? Is your attitude right? Concerning this. You know, the Bible says that our attitude should be like that of Jesus. Actually, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, go there for me, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. When you get there, say amen. amen. The Bible says, If therefore be, excuse me, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, are you with me? If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that you be like-minded. Does that have anything to do with attitude? 
Be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And then it says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, which means humility and humbleness, that each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man unto his own things, but every man also the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mindset? What we just read from verses 1 through 5. Humble. Caring more about somebody else than you do yourself. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we are taught and are being taught daily by the Holy Spirit. When we obey Him with regard to your former way of life, that we are to actively put off the old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of our minds, but we have to conscientiously work at it. That's what the Word of God says in Ephesians 4.22. Remember what we read in Ephesians 4.22? That whole chapter that we read, uh, starting with 4.17 through, I forgot, 20, what was it, uh, 22? 32, oh, yeah, 32. But verse 22 says this, that you put off concerning that you put off concerning. That was the, the ma major thrust of our text, that you put off, you put off, concerning your old attitudes. And that's what it's about, isn't it? You have to. Most of us, brothers and sisters, can easily identify bad attitudes, amen? Especially in someone else, right? <laughs> yeah. When they're displayed uh, outwardly in words or actions, such as negativeness, criticalness, rebellion, defiance, impatience, uncooperativeness, apathy, discouragement, independence, presumption, arrogance, self-centeredness, rudeness, and such like. There's nothing I hate more than someone being rude because there's no excuse for that. I'll never forget as a waiter, you experience a lot of attitudes. As a waitress, you know what I'm talking about. And some of the things that used to really tick me off was the rudeness of some people. And you know what really ticked me off more than, than just, especially when I became a believer, a true believer, was the rudeness of professing believers to other people. That just, I mean, could not believe that. And I heard it more and more and more just being outright rude and thinking nothing of it, nothing of it. Like, you won't get over that. It doesn't matter. What do you mean? Yeah, I'll get over it because I have to forgive. To be forgiven. But God help you just for the fact that you have the attitude of get over it. That is such an arrogant statement. Because God will tell you when you stand before him. You remember when you told that person? Just get over it? Well, I'm telling you right now, get over it. Because how you mean out something is how it's going to be needed back to you. So the word of God says. So stop and think about your attitude. Your attitudes do not go unnoticed, and they are sinful. Because they lead to murmuring and complaining. They're sinful to man. They're sinful to your brothers and sisters. They're sinful to God. And I promise you, you'll never have or experience the gift of peace that the Lord God has ordained and given to you and I, when you're walking in a lousy attitude. I know from experience. If my attitude's right, no matter what God's blessed me with, I can't enjoy it. Anybody know what I'm saying? You see, God's blessed me with a lot of things. My health, my home, my vehicles, you guys, this ministry. But if my attitude's wrong, no matter what he's blessed me with, I can't enjoy it. And everybody can see it. I know people that have been blessed coming backwards and forwards, and their attitude is lousy, and everybody knows it. And it's because they choose to have a lousy attitude. Is that right, Sister Wood? Is anybody saying amen to what I'm talking about? Amen. Well, if you're saying amen to it, then we have the solution to it too, right? You can choose to have a right attitude, a better attitude. It's called gratefulness. It's called thankfulness. Brothers and sisters, 
There are many examples of bad attitudes which Christians need to reject and cast them down because they will lead to judgment one way or another. How? Because they, and you and I will, if we will come before the Lord God. And everything that our attitude that we have, I, I can't, I hope I can make it clear enough to you. If you choose to have a, a negative attitude, a downcast attitude, a poor me attitude, a victim mentality attitude, then you're going to bear the consequences of those things. You're going to bear that, that you sow. Your attitude is what determines whether or not you have a stepping stone or a, step, or, or, or a stumbling block. And your attitude determines whether or not people see you as a witness of the kingdom of God or just someone who talks about the kingdom. See, you don't have to have a whole lot of things to have the right attitude, but you have to walk with the Lord to have a right attitude. Now, you may know the Lord. You may know Him as your Savior. You, know, you may know Him as a lot of things, but until you know Him as Lord, meaning reigning on your heart, reigning in your heart, on the attitude of your heart, then all you've done is allow the world to point the finger at you and, and say, who's your God? Is this what, how you, you react when you're walking with the, the so-called Lord of your life? Is this the God that you want me to, to, that you want to introduce me to, that you can't even be happy with what he's blessed you with? If you don't have anything material-wise, but you have the joy of the Lord, you have everything. But if you have everything material-wise and not the joy of the Lord, you have nothing. First, 10, First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 10 through 12, speaks about bad attitudes which Christians need to reject and to cast them down because they will lead to judgment one way or another. Because they form a negative attitude that produces ungratefulness which leads up to sounding like murmuring complaints to our God. Did the people of the Old Testament end up murmuring complaining to God? Was God unhappy with that? Did he deal with their attitudes? Yes, he did. Many of them were destroyed in the wilderness. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 10 through 12, it says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmur. Well, Pastor, I don't murmur, really. You're going to tell me you don't murmur when you're walking around being oppressed, walking around talking about all the, how miserable you are. Is that not murmuring, complaining? I've met people that, that have so much and they're so unhappy. You say, well, at least I'm not talking about it. You don't have to speak about it with words. Your confidence shows exactly what's going on in your heart. Your attitude is not a mind thing, it's a heart produce. The Bible said, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Beware of the slippery ground your own. If you have misery, if you're sad, if you're constantly complaining about the fact that nothing's changing in your life, then you're on slippery ground. You know why? Because bitterness will come forth. No matter what you have, God has blessed you with bitterness, double-mindedness, and doubt will come forth. These are all things that come from the fact that you did not put off the old man. And how many of you know that the old man is, how many of you change clothes every day or every other day? I'm not being personal. <laughs> how many of you know before you put on the new set of clothes, you're to take a bath and you're to take off the old clothes? How many of you know that if you don't take a bath and put on clean clothes, you're still dirty? How many of you know that if you take a bath, leave on the old clothes and put on clean clothes, you're still dirty? So the whole cliche of everything is if you want the right attitude, you got to get rid of the 
old attitude first, right? And you got to do that every day. Not just when you come on a Wednesday or a Sunday. Not just for your holidays that you celebrate. Every day. Every day. We must understand we are not who we used to be literally. And I claim that. Let me tell you something. When Satan comes against me, the reason why he can come against me is because I start thinking about who I used to be. And I have to remind myself, when the Bible says I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, one of the things passed away, all things become new. I'm a work in progress, but it's a literal work. It's not symbolic. It's not in figurative speech. It is true. But I've got to fight for it. I've got to work it out. And I've got to take responsibility concerning my attitude. Attitudes are inner dispositions of the heart and thoughts. Don't you understand that? Yours, not mine. And most of the time, they're hidden intentions which will eventually serve as the basis for your actions or mine. We all have heard the scripture reference that we read in Proverbs all the time. Proverbs 23, verses, uh, uh, what is it, 7, 8, where the Bible says that for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, in truth, brothers and sisters, that's the bottom line. That is the truth. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So in other words, whatever your attitude is in the inner parts of your heart is how you're going to act on a daily basis. And you know something? You and I are not guaranteed tomorrow. So your attitude adjustment needs to be now. My attitude adjustment needs to be now. Now you may be okay to you in other areas, but all you got to do is ask others how your attitude is. And if they're honest enough and love you enough, they will tell you. Your attitude is either medium, low, or hot. And, I, and most people will say, well, you know, I'm medium. No, most of the time you're far from medium. Most of the time I'm far from medium. I want to be hot. I want to be hot for the Lord. I want to believe everything is possible with God. I want to believe that there's nothing set in stone but my feet when I, don't, when I refuse to take a step up. If you want to stay where you are, stay where you are. Take your chances when you face the Lord and let him ask you what you did with this new life. Give him the excuses that you give yourself why you don't change the way that you act and respond. What kind of airplane pilot are you when you don't take the attitude, the horizontal relationship of your landing into, into consideration before you enter into a position? Or enter into a relationship with someone. Or enter into the solution considering a certain circumstance that you have. Brothers and sisters, I've heard it said, nobody knows my heart but God. I agree totally. And nobody knows the motive of your heart but God. But I want you to know, if you don't change your attitude, and your attitude is from old proved produce, not only God knows your heart, but everybody else sees your heart. I don't have to know your heart to see your heart, because given enough time, whatever's in your heart will come out. And that's a fact. Amen? So consequently, attitude is something that only you and God can work out and change, which must take place inwardly. The right attitude to have when difficulty come, comes is to persevere in faith and draw nearer to God. And if we need to seek out prayer warriors to help you stand, to keep the right attitude of faith, obedience, and love, and humility, then seek them out. But be honest. Say, hey, listen, I'm having a lousy attitude. I need some help here to deal with this attitude. Well, I, I want to go at all with God. Well, you haven't done too well so far. Sometimes you, you need to get off your bandwagon, get off your pride ship, and start allowing the Lord God to to bring in the people that you need to bring into your life to remind you just who you are not and who you are. It's called humility. Before honor, you must first have humility. 
Church, let me ask you this. If bitterness, oppression, or depression, or whatever it is that's ungodly, is ruling in your heart, then is it God's fault? If bitterness or unforgiveness is in your heart right now, if depression or if doubt or double-mindedness or unthankfulness or ungratefulness is in your heart, then God's not reigning in your heart. God's not going to reign on a throne that is negative. God's not going to reign on an attitude, an attitude that is that is ungrateful and ugly. So I'm not ungrateful, but your actions and your confidence says you are. Yeah, I, you people say, yeah, but I just don't feel like I gotta walk around with a big smile on my face. It's better to try to smile than to trip over your, your lips that are hanging down. I'm not being ugly or facetious, I'm just being point blank honest. Because you know something? It's much better to hear from me than to hear from the Lord, because you will hear from the Lord. I will hear from the Lord. The Bible makes it clear that God works all things together for good when we love Him, according to Romans 8, 28. The Bible confirms that the testing of your faith, my faith, is to benefit you and benefit me. And I want you to know, Sister Flo, trouble will never defeat the person with the right attitude. And that's the truth. There's never a time for bad attitude. Never a justified time for bad attitude. Have I had them? Yes. And God's dealt with them. I don't have the time to go through them. In fact, I could stay, stay here for a, a solid week telling you of some of the times the bad attitudes that I've had and God's dealt with me. And when I dealt with those bad attitudes, things changed. Did the circumstances change? No, but I did. And when you change, it doesn't matter about the circumstances. Satan can't have what you don't give him. And your attitude, if you give, if you walk in a lousy attitude, and I want to tell you something, you are giving place to Satan. I'm just about out of time, so bear with me. The Bible tells us we can do all things in Christ Jesus who strengthens us. So we have no excuses. We only have our choices. So it's your choice. It's my choice. And I want to ask you, how do you, how do you want to face Jesus? Do you think your tithes and offerings are going to smooth it all over before the Lord? Do you think that doing all the right religiosities will smooth it over with the Lord? No. Even your tithes and offerings have to have the right attitude. Coming to church has to have the right attitude. Hearing the word of God has to have the right attitude. Doing unto others has to have the right attitude. How you address brothers and sisters has to have the right attitude. It's about not about what they've done to you, but how you can help them. When you help others, you're helping yourself. When you forgive others, guess what? It makes it easier for others to forgive you. However you meet our judgment, that judgment is measured back unto you. If you find that you gain the weight spiritually but in the wrong direction, then the way that you get rid of it is to cast off the besetting sin and the heavy weights that you've accumulated in your attitudes. I've had to do. See, the Bible tells you and I, if you read it, with the direction of instruction, it tells us that it's your call. How do you want to face Jesus when you meet him? With what attitude will you stand before him? And with what excuse will you try to give him for what we did, but that you like to give us? Your attitude towards life? Your circumstances or toward other people should always be like the Lord's. As, it, as is defined by Scripture, good attitudes are generally demonstrated in being positive, encouraging, loving, humble, 
Now, are you any of those things today? Have you been pretty much? Uh, I'm not going to ask that. That's, you know where you've been, where you've not. Are you positive? Are you encouraging? Are you loving? Are you humble? Are you teachable? Are you cooperative? Are you considerate? Are you selfless? Are you loyal? Are you persevering? Are you... What I'm asking is to find your relationship with Christ because this is what this is all about. What is your attitude to God? Psalm 11, 10 tells you what it should be. Mark 12, 30. John 14, 15. James 4, 7. Don't have the time to give you all the scriptures, brothers and sisters, but let me ask you, what is your attitude towards God? Secondly, what is your attitude toward God's sons and daughters? Your attitude should be love, forgiveness, and consideration, care and encouragement, kindness, humility, unselfishness, respectfulness, and partiality. John 13, 34 through 35. John 15, 12. Romans 12, 10. Romans 13, 10. Romans 15, 7. John 13, 34 through 35. John 15, 12. Romans 12, 10. Romans 13, 10. Romans 15, 7. I got a bunch of other scriptures, but now I can go through them because we're running out of time, like I said. So you find out what these scriptures are. You seek them out in your own home study. You first you need to know what your attitude toward God is and search scriptures to find out what your attitude is supposed to be towards God. Secondly, search out what your attitude is supposed to be before, uh, to the sons and daughters of God. Thirdly, what is your attitude toward God's ordained authority here in church and in the town and in the city and in the nation? Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews, uh, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. This is ordained authority. What is your attitude towards me as your pastor? Are you talking behind my back? Are you second guessing what the word of God that I'm preaching is saying? God says that the ordained authority is to be respected. If you don't respect me, respect the position that God has placed here in this church. What is your attitude toward hard circumstances? Is your attitude filled with patience and thankfulness, persevering and believing? You know, God's ordained authority demands that you and I have the attitude of respectfulness, cooperativeness, accountableness, humbleness, helpfulness, encouraging, loyal, not resentful, defiant, or disrespectful. And number five, what is your attitude towards your church, church body? Is our, our attitude should be respectful and faithful and cooperative, willing and dependable, participating. And number six, what is your attitude, your duty to the body of Christ? Our attitude should be about faithfulness, responsible, responsibleness, and obedience and cooperation and endurance to the Lord. He says, you have been given much, much is required. And you and I need to understand something. You can't have a relationship with God if you're not willing to have a relationship with the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I can go on and on and on, but his sisters told me I'm running out of time. But write this, number seven. What is your attitude towards unfairness? Romans 12, 19, Luke 18, 7. What is your attitude to disappointment or tragedy? Psalm 62, 5. Jeremiah 17, 5. What is your attitude toward the lost today? 2 Corinthians 5, 18. 2 Peter 3, 9. What is your attitude to sin? Our attitude to sin should be uncompromising, unaccepting, intolerant, unsympathetic, yet compassionate and reconciliatory to the repentant. Matthew 18, verses 8 through 9, and Galatians 6, 1. What is your attitude towards or to success? Our attitude should be humble, grateful, God-glorifying, and not self-exalting. And last but not least, 
What is your attitude towards misunderstanding? Your attitude towards misunderstanding should be about making peace, reconciliatory, patient, and forgiving. Colossians 3.13 and Matthew 5, 9. I close with this. All these things that I'm talking about, <coughs> considering beware of the slippery ground you're on, is dependent upon your attitude, your choices, and what attitude you want to walk in. And to have the right attitude, all of us needs to apply self-examination. Uh, self we need to identify and repent of bad attitudes, not just talk about them. Number two, you need to submit your attitude to God by asking Him to help you get rid of it. And number three, you need to equip and feed your right attitude while starving the wrong attitudes. The Bible says we're to bring our attitudes to the obedience of God's word. We must apply discipline to our thought life. You must and I must submit our thoughts to, to those of Christ in a real and a conscious way, or a conscientious way. A good attitude is a matter of faith, disregarding your own feelings with it. Determination to embrace God's outlook and disposition. There's two things I'll leave you with tonight. You are responsible for casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And number two, you are to dwell purposely in God's word that tells them to think upon good things, virtuous things. If you dwell on the negative, your attitude will reflect the same. To me, the clearest word concerning your attitude is found in Philippians 4 8. And I close with that. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And let me give you a little. Love you as you leave tonight. Remember, slippery ground is only dangerous when you walk on it. Father God, right now I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that found a place in my heart. I thank you, Lord God, that I make a conscientious choice every day when I see that. My attitude is producing old produce, things that I cast off, depression, oppression, anger, malice, bitterness. Lord, that's not who I am. I refuse that. And I refuse that because I have the power to cast off the old man. And Lord, I thank you that I'm able to cast off the old man every time I renew my mind and see where I have fallen short. And Lord, not only do I cast off that old man and the conduct of that old man, but I put on the new man. And in putting on the new man, Father God, in order to walk in the new man, Lord God, I change my attitude. Anything that produces a negative effect in my life, I cast out and I start feeding that that produces positive results in my life. Not to change circumstances, but that changes me in the midst of that circumstance. Father, I give you all the glory, and I thank you, Lord, that, Lord God, you are for me, not against me. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. You give God the glory.